So uh, thanks so much, uh, Paula, and um, I have to start by saying that it's an immense pleasure to have you all here and to be able to host uh, this uh, user group meeting. We've been discussing about this for a long time, and I think uh, well, it's a pity that the pandemic got in the way. We should have done this uh, uh, several years before. But uh, my house is your house, as we say in Spain, and we're willing to do it as many times as you, as you like. Um, so, um, disclaimer. So, a little bit about myself. I'm a principal investigator at the Department of Molecular Cell Biology and Immunology here in the uh, 11th floor. And then my research group is, uh, we call it the immune system cytomics, and we uh, do translational research, mostly doing using immune monitoring strategies on all kinds of uh, uh, research uh, topics, mostly cancer, glioblastoma is our primary uh, focus of interest, but we've also been looking at autoimmunity, infectious diseases, and more recently, uh, exposure to, to microplastics. We also do some kind of, some fundamental research on high dimensional cytometry methods, both at the uh, bioinformatics level, and also in the development of uh, chemical tools. Uh, like anyone working in the university, I, I try to juggle with multiple jobs, uh, so I'm doing teaching uh, as well most of the time. And I'm also the director of the core facility here, also at the 11th floor. So I'd like to take now the opportunity to, uh, to show you a little bit what we have here. And if you would like to come and visit the facility during the networking event, please reach out to me or to Cora at the back or Sarah, and we'll be happy to bring you uh, to the 11th floor and to show you around. And so I think that the, the this building we will recognize at least from this morning, at least from outside. And um, we occupy the uh, central alley in the 11th floor. And uh, well, we cover all kinds of technologies in flow cytometry and uh, microscopy as well. And one thing that um, we're very proud of is that we, uh, the way we interact with our users is not through the traditional, conventional way in which people come and say, hey, I want to use that uh, uh, confocal microscope. No, the way that we interact with our users is you tell us what is your research question. And from all the 25, 26 different instruments that we have in the facility, we'll tell you which one is the best fitting with your application. And we'll take you through uh, the, the process, optimize your uh, uh, application. And if, if it doesn't work, we'll work with you to move you to the next uh, technology. And, and, and still some people resist and they try to say, okay, no, but I want to use that instrument. I know better than you. And we listen to everyone, of course, but we've had very funny experiences of people that came for a microscopy experiment and uh, ended up doing flow cytometry and, <laughs> and vice versa. And uh, I can say this uh, uh, right now, in fact, Microscopy is just a case example of cytometry. I mean, these people are just counting cells, right? Anyway, so um, so today I would like to to talk about the work that has been done in my group. Uh, we are ongoing research, actually, uh, by a PhD student, very talented PhD student, uh, Marta Rittleib. She's uh, sitting uh, there in the back. She is uh, uh, coming from the toxicology fields and and doing. A PhD in immunology, and you must be very, very brave uh, uh, to do this. But we're very happy to have you here in the team. And also, uh, a great part of the project has been contributed by uh, Cora uh, with her knowledge on the active side picks and, and all the technologies that we have in the, in the flow cytometry facility. Now, this, uh, this study uh, was triggered in 2018 when, when it was communicated. Uh, that uh, microplastics were discovered in human stool. And this was this happened during the summer and in, in a gastroenterology conference in Austria. And a colleague in the second floor who works in the uh, uh, environmental health and we were good friends. And then she said, well, you know, I think if they're found in, in human stool, they must be in other places as well in the human body. And here, I mean, I, could, I couldn't believe her, she said, astronomic amounts of microplastics were present in the environment that you could detect them everywhere. So um, she convinced me that we should look into this um, in human blood. So um, uh, that's 
systematically she used this kind of information to to convince me that actually the the fractionation of micro of plastics in the environment results in very very tiny amounts that spread very quickly and the in really really high numbers and um now you can see this. Uh, this is an article in Science by uh, Dick uh, uh, Fepak and Juliette Leckler. They were uh, also in the second floor here in this building. And I think there is so much said and, and, and written about uh, microplastics in, in human health in the last uh, couple of years, not only in the specialized uh, scientific journals, but also in the news. And I'm not going to uh, talk about this anymore. <laughs> What we did back then was to apply to an emerging uh, research call by our uh, medical research foundation uh, and the call uh, there, and uh, and we got a sort of a seed grant to to get started with this uh, uh, research, and um, basically the the study <clears throat> relied very heavily on the expertise of my colleague uh, Heather, which was uh, um, the mass spectrometry. And what we did basically was to collect uh, uh, blood from, from healthy human donors, basically our colleagues, and uh, the blood was enzymatically uh, digested, filtered, and this uh, was very important to get, uh, to capture the, these quartz filters uh, particulate uh, material, so to let everything that was soluble go through, so no monomers of uh, micro of plastic could be detected in this assay, only uh, microplastics, <coughs> and then these um, uh, uh, filters were placed in a pyrolysis uh, cup, and then they were subjected to a very fancy machine called double shot pyrolysis GCMS, whatever that is. <laughs> and, um, and then very smart people in the second floor were able to, uh, to analyze this uh, spectra. And then they were able to identify uh, microplastics from six common mm, plastic uh, uh, materials that are used in, in common day life, in packaging and everything. <laughs> polystyrene, or TVC, the, <clears throat> the typical ones. And um, we sent this to, to high-profile journal, journals and, and we got it back uh, with very long and sceptical uh, reviews that, um, that didn't want to believe it. Eventually, we decided to publish it in Environmental uh, International, uh, which is a, a very well-respected uh, journal in the field of um, environmental health. And um, this uh, story got a lot of attention in, in the media. We got, we got interviews. In, actually, Rai 3, right? Rai 3 had a, an interview uh, last uh, uh, week. Uh, it was a very, very interesting thing for a scientist uh, li like me to actually interact with a journalist. They actually push you to, push you to say things that you don't want to say, so, um, and because everyone was at that moment very uh, concerned about the potential risks of having microplastics in, in your blood, which is, of course, an understandable thing. But what we were communicating about was not about the, the, the human effect of having microplastic in your blood, but just the, the fact that we could detect microplastics in it. <coughs> anyway. Um, this still, I mean, I could deal with that and, and it was fun. The most difficult was, I think, dealing with other scientists that didn't believe your story. Because they would come up with, with all kind of really, really difficult questions about, yeah, but have you seen the microplastics? Uh, and how big are they? And how many particles? And, and they were also very concerned about the uh, uh, the data because the microplastics, when you detect a microplastic, you, of course, is a, is a particulate uh, thing. And then in the, in the data, you will see, you will not see a continuous increase in the mass. You will see jumps in it because it, it could be the result of one, two or three multiple um, uh, microplastics. So 
So we had a lot of uh, concern in the, in the scientific community. And, um, and we actually had people emailing us very aggressively. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, but um, I'm very happy that that happened in, in a couple, year and a half ago. And in this time, uh, many people have been able to replicate our funding. And actually, Jordi here in the first floor, in the first uh, row, uh, was one of them, and he will talk about it uh, uh, tomorrow. But microplastics have been found in many other uh, organs uh, as well. So I uh, have uh, uh, placed them here in this uh, way because you see uh, from the airways, if you, they can be found in the lung and in Bregualbe La Vache. They have been found also in uh, gastrointestinal. Uh, tissues or samples collected from gastrointestinal tissues, for example, from the feces. And you can imagine that these are the roots in which the microplastics come into our inner space. Blood is involved in perhaps distributing uh, them. And then they can be secreted. They have been found in human milk. They have been found in the placenta and obviously also in the meconium. And, uh, and also in the, in the spring. And I think that if we keep uh, searching with, <laughs> with uh, more and more sensitive uh, technologies, we'll be able to find them uh, as well. Now, all these uh, findings are, of course, based on uh, very complex uh, analytical methods, but I'm very happy that also uh, Jordi has demonstrated that uh, using flow cytometry uh, is a very uh, good way to demonstrate, to show the presence of uh, microplastics. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you a presentation or, or you can do that tomorrow. Um, but one, the, one of the things that we really liked in the, in the paper of uh, Jordi is that um, by using uh, hydrophil um, hydrophobic uh, or lactophilic dye, like Nile Red, you will be able to uh, reveal highly hydrophobic uh, uh, compounds or, or, or particulate uh, uh, objects like microplastics that are left after you have digested completely all the organic components in blood. And uh, now Nile Red is something that we know from the 80s, those that are old enough <laughs> to remember about this. And this is uh, uh, a dye that becomes uh, very fluorescent once it's uh, intercalating with uh, with lipids, or and then it associates, and then it changes its uh, its properties. So um, we wanted to uh, to um, uh, replicate the, the method that uh, uh, Jordi had uh, developed because we wanted to have very badly pictures of those microplastics to show to these really uh, aseptic scientists that were challenging our findings. So we went back to our uh, procedure uh, as complete enzymatic digestion of the blood, uh, filtration, and then from the filter, we alluded it directly onto uh, water and then put it in the cytokines. Now, uh, I'm not gonna show data here because these quartz filters, they have also <laughs> lots of very small particles, which are glass, basically fibers that will contaminate your, your images and it will be very difficult to distinguish what is microplastic and what is a, a fiber. But uh, directly from this step, you can already uh, put it on the, on the um, side picks. And, uh, and this is a typical analysis that you can, you can do in the, in the uh, side picks, you first, uh, after you have processed your uh, images, you focus on the cell, on the objects that have been processed and that are not in the border of the image. Uh, you set some kind of threshold because, uh, you know, after running digested blood for a long time, you also have lots of uh, electronic noise or, or bubbles or whatnot in the, in the system. And then you focus only on the, on the bigger ones. And then you look for the uh, plastic, uh, so the Nile Red positive uh, event. And you can see here, this, uh, this is our negative control. So this is uh, digestive blood that is not stained with Nile Red. And this is digestive blood that is stained with Nile Red. 
and you can appreciate that there is a number of free events. And then if you play with the uh, AI-driven image analysis of in the Atune sidekicks, you can even distinguish the uh, events that are looking more like fathers and the ones that are looking like daughters. And I'm going to show you some examples. So this would be the ones that fall into the into the gate that we call fibers that have a high eccentricity, so they are elongated. We could have also used circularity, and uh, and the ones that uh, have uh, low uh, eccentricity, then that would go qualify more as particles. And then this would be probably the first pictures ever of microplastics in your blood. Um, remember this moment. 21st <laughs> um, so, um, so then we went uh, uh, further with, uh, with this and we noticed that um, we, we wanted to also, another thing that we wanted to do, we wanted to sort these uh, events, send them for analysis by uh, double shot pyrolysis GCMS to verify that these are indeed the microplastics that we expect to see so that we can kind of validate the system and then do a bigger uh, screening. So we did some spike experiments and then in our ex spike experiment then we actually noticed that there were some uh, funny uh, events there. So we wanted to know a bit more uh, detailed what that was. So what we did was to do to first uh, uh, sort and then reanalyze with the two sidekicks. And uh, to our surprise, when we did that, then depending on the uh, gate that we take, you can appreciate that the spectrum of the uh, particles that we see changes. And that here you have a double spectrum in this high event, in this, this high uh, side color gate. Now we bring this back, well, we used uh, the, this difference in the spectrum to create two fake uh, colors, basically. And with the help of these two fake colors, we uh, set up some uh, sorting gates. And this is the magic of uh, Cora uh, and, and Sarah here at the, at the back, of course. And after sorting, uh, I don't know what happened here, oh, yeah. uh, then we were able to reproduce these uh, um, scatters, went and brought that back into the side picks. And you can appreciate that if you focus on this one that had this funny uh, spectra, then you can start to see some really interesting uh, things happening here. We don't know yet if these are nine red crystals. We don't know if these are aggregates of fibers or something that are attaching to them, but this is definitely something that we need to keep in mind when we carry on with the, with the um, study. Still, I think what's really, really important is at some point when we do the, the final experiment in which the sorted material we send it to, uh, to the analysis, then we will really see if we can find their PVC, polystyrene, uh, etc. So um, in this uh, study, we are uh, also not only looking at uh, developing uh, methods to do uh, screening and the development for, and for microplastics in blood, but we are also looking into what are the immunological consequences of exposure to microplastics in, in humans in a control setting. And for that, we are working in a large uh, European consortia called, uh, consortium called uh, PolyRisk. And within this consortium, we have uh, three study groups, one in Norway, one in Utrecht uh, here nearby, and another one in Romania. The uh, ones in Utrecht and Norway are uh, people practicing sports in environments where there's a high contamination with particulate um, uh, materials. And Norway is actually uh, indoor football. They sort of spray these places with uh, tire granulates. And um, in the one in Utrecht is actually an outdoor uh, space where uh, 
close to a highway, so there's also lots of uh, uh, particles uh, in the environment that, in that place. And the one in Romania is in a, in a factory where they produce all kind of clothing, um, as you can imagine, also with a high content in, in plastic. And so what we are uh, doing in these studies is in parallel, we're measuring the black concentration of microplastics and other uh, nanoparticles. And then, at this, and then we are in the same samples, we're looking at broad immune phenotyping and then doing all kind of in vitro assays. So this is a, a data that I got this morning from, from March. <laughs> what you see here, these are actually uh, tires from, so, so rubber tires from, um, yeah, from wheels actually. And, and these are the images that you can see in the uh, side picks. These are aggregates, so these are the bigger ones. So there are lots of many more uh, um, particles like this, just the smaller. But in this experiment, they were coated with, uh, with proteins so that we can actually uh, track them. And what you see here, these are macrophages that have been exposed to these uh, rubber tires. And I want you to pay attention to, for example, this cell over here, all kind of really dark uh, dots in, in there, or this one, for example. And these are cells that have ingested this uh, 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 tire crumbles or, or particles. So one of the things that uh, March is doing is investigating whether this has any impact in the fun normal functioning of these uh, macrophages. And she's looking at uh, the phagocytosis capacity of these cells uh, or the immune uh, modulatory capacity. Is that for me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the immune modulatory capacity of the uh, macrophages. And, and actually earlier this week, there was already a, a paper published indicating that uh, uh, exposure in, in children to rubber tires uh, could be connected with the induction of allergy via trained uh, immunity. So we're very excited that this will uh, go in that direction as well. And one of the other things that we like to do is, of course, uh, immunophenotyping. But I'm not gonna, this is not the topic of the presentation today. But basically, this is our, our um, immunophenotyping strategy. So in summary, we have chemical and physical evidence that shows the presence of microplastics in blood and in different uh, organs. We don't know yet whether these microplastics have a negative effect on immune health. This is something I have learned with my interactions with the media. <laughs> you, don't, you don't tell this because otherwise they will put uh, words in the mouth, like for example, uh, children uh, drink uh, microplastics uh, from infant for, uh, from, from uh, formula milk and stuff like that. <clears throat> and, uh, and that the studies combining exposure, blood accumulation and immunological changes are, are necessary for uh, to assess the micro immunological risk of microplastic exposure. So I wouldn't like to finish without uh, thanking all the people that have been involved in this uh, work, in particular uh, Marche and Marluz, uh, Cora and Sara, also the PolyRisk uh, Consortium, and Heather Leslie when we started this uh, research, but now continuing with uh, Maria uh, Lamore, and I'm really happy with the collaboration with uh, Thermo Fisher every Wednesday as a party discussing or everything about microplastics and many other things. And, and your feedback is extremely useful in, uh, in this project and several others. So with that, I would like to uh, take any questions before we move on to day two. <laughs> <laughs>